So welcome to this afternoon's Paraboss webinar. For those of you who are new to Paraboss, it is Australia's resource for the control of worms, lice, flies and ticks in cattle, sheep and goats. So today, though, we're going to be talking all about goats and shortly I'll introduce our presenter today, who is Dr. Matt Playford. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Fiona MacArthur and I work at the Parabos Extension Team. Parabos is a joint initiative of Australian Wool Innovation, Meat and Livestock Australia, the University of New England and Animal Health Australia. For you who don't know Matt, which I find hard to believe because he's a bit of a regular here at Parabos, um, Matt is our, our technical advisor here at Parabos and he owns his own parasitology laboratory where he does work on all species, cattle, sheep and goats for producers and also for livestock industries um, for their research side of things. So Matt's been around for um, a while in our industry. He is certainly very competent across all levels that we're going to be talking about today. So welcome, Matt, and thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Fiona. I've got your presentation up, so you're good to go. Okay, g'day everyone. Now we are going to be talking about next level healthy goats because we've talked quite a bit in the past on these webinars about uh, drenches, how to use them and how to actually um, uh, supplement the use of drenches for worm control in goats. Now, this time we're going to be focusing on all of those things apart from drenches to get to next level healthy goats. But to actually get there, we need to think a little bit about the um, the philosophy or the the history of uh, managing goats. And here we can see a couple of um, photographs that were taken a long time ago. In fact, it looks like the um, one on the right is a nativity scene and there's an angel coming down from heaven and talking to, well, it says in the Bible that they were shepherds, but I can see a few goats here. This, uh, this bloke here is definitely a goat and you can see this one hooking up into the trees, obviously showing goat behaviour. This one's the same story, got the typical goat horns. So I think the um, the goat herders, should be included in the, the message from heaven. And if you can read the, um, the writing on this message from the angel, it says there are no drenches. And the goat herder there is saying, come on, can't you give us some drenches? Back in those days, they didn't have any drenches. And here, same, same message coming from heaven. They didn't have any drenches. The sheep are down here butting heads and doing silly things. Whereas the goats, very sensible, sticking their heads up and eating the trees because that's what goats do in their natural environment. That's what they love to do. And they know that there's no worms on those leaves. So after we went to the Vatican uh, to get that message, we headed down to University of Naples. And this is a vet school in the University of Naples. And um, I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised, but there's frescoes on the walls and on the ceiling of the, um, the quadrangle where the, uh, both the, the students are hanging around um, having their morning coffee and also the, uh, the clients of the small animal veterinary clinic are bringing in their pets to be seen. But I talked to them about goat worm control and they said, well, we just put our sheep and goats out on paddocks like this. They took me down the Amalfi Coast and that's the type of situation you see. They never never bother about uh, worms too much because they're on these uh, paddocks that they rotate very regularly. Now, these give us just a couple of clues about the uh, old-fashioned means of uh, looking after goats to prevent worms. And to extend the theme, most of the goats in the world are kept in places where they have either very extensive um, paddocks like these ones in Mongolia, where the nomadic uh, herds people uh, pick up their yurts, uh, their, um, their, you know, their, their like big framed tents that they move from location to location. And they move the goats from paddock to paddock across the steppes or the, the Central Asian plains 
before they have a chance to build up uh, worm infections. And then they, they spend the winters uh, feeding them out hay or other preserved foods in these um, corrals. Now, that is a very sustainable way of managing goats without very large worm burdens. The goats develop immunity to worms. They've got sufficient uh, uh, nutrition to have high levels of resilience to worms and they don't build up worm burdens that are life-threatening. Now, in contrast, we tend to put goats behind fences uh, simply because of the demands of modern goat management, because each person has their own farm. You can't let them stray. We're not nomadic, and therefore we're in one fixed place. We put goats behind fences, and immediately we create a situation where the longer the goats stay on that paddock, the more contaminated those paddocks become with the larvae that develop from the eggs that the goats are depositing. So that's just to establish the, uh, the situation here in Australia. Now, I did a little bit more research over in Malaysia in January this year, and this is a goat that I noticed. Um, there's a couple, of, a couple of goats on this particular farm and they, they actually tie them up by a bit of rope around their neck and um, then move them from place to place. This is another way of approaching the, um, the same problem of uh, moving goats from place to place without them wandering off. However, this method of goat management doesn't measure up to Australian standards of animal welfare. So we have to think up something that is even better. And uh, when I actually talked to the farmer and examined this goat, you can see it's got a bit of bottle jaw. It had very, very pale mucous membranes. And it looked like it had uh, been suffering from barbus pole worms. So barbus pole worms, big problem in Malaysia. But let's have a look uh, because it's been very topical over the last few uh, years at the situation in Australia. Now, in our laboratory over the last um, uh, several years, I've went back through the records. We've done worm egg counts on about four and a half thousand goats. And um, from those samples, from uh, those and the sheep samples as well, we're able to put together a little map of where we had confirmed barbers pole worm. You can see the red dots are where the entire um, worms in the animals are almost all barbers pole worms. Orange means that there's about um, between 50 and 70 percent. Yellow, there's a low number of barbers pole worms. And you can see that uh, the submissions to our, our lab in 2019 shows right throughout New South Wales, there are very high levels of barbers pole worm being cultured. Uh, 2020, which was the first um, wet year that we've had in this um, past uh, La Nina um, series of seasons, we actually got samples in from other places that showed um, moderate to high levels of barbers pole worm as well outside of New South Wales, including northern Tasmania and in southern Western Australia. Then as we moved further into the wet conditions, it seems that the barbers pole worms um, reports were spreading and a lot more in that um, Western Victoria and the southeast of South Australia region and more reports from uh, Tasmania. And then by the time we got to 2022, we can see, and these are just samples that came into the Dorbert's lab, which is located in Camden. So it definitely isn't um, indicative of what's happening all over Australia, but we've had barbers pole worm um, reports exploding right across Australia. And it's a very strong indication, of, a visual reminder to me that um, we are seeing unprecedented levels of barbers pole worm due to the fact that the last few summers have actually been wet. And that in Southern Australia in particular, usually when you have a, a dry hot summer, it breaks the life cycle of the barbers pole worms but whenever we have summer rain, it means that they are able to survive, develop and thrive so that they're continually there 
to reinfect our goats. So that's just a snapshot, a bit of background to help us move into some concrete steps that we can take uh, to provide next level healthy goats. So let's look at the agenda for today. And uh, that's pictures just from Razorback, from um, uh, Sandy, uh, my wife going about doing some um, worm egg counts on, on goats with our neighbours. So the first take home message, and we, we really, really do need to uh, pull this apart a bit. Drenches don't work well in goats and are dangerous. So two very negative messages there. Drenches don't work well in goats as a rule, and they're dangerous. The reason they don't work well in goats is goats we know are renowned for having a very strong metabolism, very strong liver that immediately starts to break down any drench they're given. doesn't matter if it is given as an oral, an injectable or a pour on, they immediately break it down and so it's not very effective. The other thing about them being dangerous, we'll, we'll look a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail about that. The second major point, we can help stock avoid high doses of worms by paddock management, and we can help them cope with worms using nutrition and immunity. Immunity also known as resistance. I, I want to use the word immunity when we're talking about goats killing worms because the word resistance also relates to the parasites having resistance against drenches. We don't want to confuse those two concepts. And then part C, we can plan for a low risk property by using diagnostics, monitoring and integrating a worm control calendar into your annual management plan. Okay, well, let's have a look at drenches and goats. Now, again, this is um, my neighbours from just up the road in Razorback, and every time they uh, are thinking, the goats, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe losing weight or not as active as they are, they do a worm egg count, and they drench the goats using the appropriate uh, drench. And 14 days after the drench, they do another worm egg count to check if that drench works. Now, these are people who are very switched on. They've only got small numbers of goats. They've got quite a large property for them. And so their drenches all work. But unless you actually have a situation like this, in most cases, the drenches don't work. Now, just to give a little bit of evidence to that statement, I know it's a very broad statement, I just want to present you with some of the latest research that's been done. And this is a fantastic study that was published um, just last year in uh, Veterinary Parasitology, which is a very prestigious journal from a team um, of researchers from South Australia, um, very, very experienced uh, researchers in the, in the field of livestock parasitology. So what they did is they actually looked at uh, a meta-analysis. So they looked at all of the data available from um, any, any location around the world where goats had been treated with drenches. And they worked out what the, um, what the overall effect of the drenches was. So a meta-analysis is an analysis of lots of different studies that have been pulled together to try and get the most reliable indication of how well the drenches are working. So let's pull it apart and have a bit of a look uh, at the details. So they actually had about, they had about 460 studies that were um, candidates and they went through them and they said, well, of those about 360 weren't reliable data. And so they focused on the 100 studies that gave very reliable data and they pooled the results into this table. And you can see table four pretty much sums up what's happening around the world with the different drenches. And just to um, just to uh, to make a, a bit of a um, shortcut, we look at white drenches and on average they only kill about 65% of the worms in goats. 
Now, this could very well be overestimating as well because some of the historical drench tests that we've done obviously um, were done at a time when the drench efficacy was pretty, pretty good and we didn't have much resistance. So today there is a lot more resistance. Levamazole, 76%. Monipantol, there's only two studies done on Monipantol at a high level, 45% average. So we're pretty, pretty ordinary. That's, uh, of course, the active ingredient in Zolvix. Now we know that Zolvix works very well most of the time in sheep, but once you put it into goats, even at a higher dose rate, it obviously has instances where it's not working. Clisantil, uh, again, only works at 81%. Uh, Levamazole, I mentioned before, 76%. The mectins, which are probably the most widely used class of drench, only working at 74%. Now, this isn't good news for any of the drench families that we commonly reach for. When you look at the combinations, they're running at about 92%. Okay, so there's a clue there as to probably how we should be going about drench selection. Combinations are definitely going to be working better than any single active. And I've just highlighted the fact there that eprinomectin, which is in Eprinex and has been registered, for example, in uh, Europe for treatment of goats in a poron. The trials that were done on Eprinex found that it worked at about 27 and a half percent. So you may as well slap them across the head with a piece of salmon because it's definitely not killing the worms inside the goats. All right, so let's just explore a little bit more into this, um, this big study and the mode of application. We look at the mode of application, there's three that were looked at, injectable, oral and poron. Even the injectable and oral weren't good, despite you know hundreds of tests being done. But look at the very, very poor results from the poor on 39%. So again, totally ineffective. You may as well you know give them a slap and um, and you know wish them well as um, give them a poor on drench. And that's information that was confirmed in the. Um, University of New England studies that were um, uh, presented last year that showed that porons in goats simply don't work well enough for us to, to warrant using them. Now, the trends are pretty much the same all over the world. You can see in Australia, the average efficacy of the different trenches is about the same as the average around the world. And the other important point to take out of this study is that barber's pole worms are the hardest to kill. So on average um, of the, the major worm species that we have in goats, Hemonchus or barber's pole worm is the most difficult to kill. Okay, so I know that that's a lot of information at a, in a very short spell and it's, it's a global type um, database that we're looking at, but a lot of trials done in Australia confirm those results and have actually shown worse results than those ones that were presented. So we can't expect drenches to ever work very well in goats. At best, we can expect them to be an aid in worm control rather than our primary, primary tool for worm control. Now, the second subject about drenches is that they are actually dangerous for goats. And let's just look at some of the examples that have been recently reviewed by Dr. Lindsay Hamilton from Animal Health Australia. And of course, the organophosphates and particularly this active ingredient known as naphthalophos, which is found in products such as uh, Ramatin or Napoleon. Um, that's quite toxic, even at two times overdose. So if you do use that, you have to be very, very cautious because uh, that can be um, highly toxic and cause deaths um, almost, almost immediately. Abamectin is very dangerous for young goats, particularly those under 15 kilograms. 
Now you'll probably notice that a lot of the combination products do contain abamectin and that's because it's quite a potent macrocyclic lactone and it is very effective against one of the most common worms, black scour worm, and it helps with the barber's pole worm and the uh, brown stomach worms. But for young goats, particularly those under 15 um, kilograms, it can be quite toxic and it causes a type of uh, comatose state where they, uh, they tend to lie down in the paddock and they can often die from exposure. Levamazole is also in a lot of products, particularly our combination products. And at uh, three times the dose rate, it can cause um, neurological signs, particularly excitement, uh, salivation, trembling, and uh, collapse and death. And Clisantil. Um, now, Clisantil is a very effective um, product against um, Barber's pole worm in many areas. But at two and a half times a recommended dose, it can actually cause um, various signs, including blindness and death. So that's another reason why we need to be very cautious when we're using drenches, because um, one of the first rules of any, any medical treatment is do no harm. We don't want to ever cause problems through doing medical treatment of our animals. Albendazole has long been regarded as a very, um, very safe uh, drench to use, but if it's used continually, can actually cause liver, liver disease, and so repeat doses can be quite dangerous. So big thanks to Dr. Lindsay for providing that summary. Now the next subject we need to um, be aware of with uh, drenches are that they do cause residues, and this is a publicly available database from the Australian government, you can look this up um, at the National Residue Survey and look at the residues in goat meat for um, each year. And the one for 2021-22 showed that 3% of the goat meat samples tested were showing uh, levels above the maximum allowed residue limit for a particular um, drench. That, that had been used. So that's an extremely important point because we rely on um, uh, safe, healthy goat meat and our reputation as suppliers of safe, healthy goat meat to allow our trade, particularly international trade, to continue unhindered. So it's important to remember that if uh, drenches are used, that we use them according to the label or according to the vet script and particularly observe the withholding periods. Okay, and you can find out more about the uh, use of drenches and cautions on the use of drenches from Parabos and look at the, um, the tools that are there in the GOAT Drench Decision Guide. Well, let's move on to healthy goats with nutrition and immunity. And this is, of course, looking at the, the situation where goats might have been um, 2,000 years ago, either wild or domesticated, where they had low stocking rates and they had unlimited fresh pasture to graze on. And not just that, but unlimited browsing materials for them to put their heads up and browse on. Now to properly understand this subject, we have to look at two key words and uh, look at their definitions because these relate to how goats um, fight their daily battle with worms. The first word is resilience. Now in this context, resilience simply means the ability to cope with worms. So if we have 100 goats, we give them the same amount of worms. Some of those goats will be thriving. They'll be dancing around, jumping on top of the shed, doing a little merry jig without a care in the world. And yet others in their same group will be lying on their side panting because they've had all the blood sucked out of them from those worms. 
Now that's, um, that's just a feature of different um, genetics within the goats that allows some to cope very well with worms and some not. Resistance is very similar, but it relates to the ability of the goats to kill off the worm. So again, if we took that same 100 goats and we took their worm egg counts, we'd find that some would have a heavy worm burden and some would have a very light worm burden because they're using their immunity, which uh, is their uh, ability to create antibodies and release um, cells that kill the worms and restrict their um, egg production. So because of that, we are able to look at uh, these two features um, both together and in isolation to work out how to improve the health of our goats. Now, both resilience and immunity or resistance are heritable in goats, but the resilience has quite a low heritability. So if you're consciously selecting for resilience, you won't make very rapid progress, but if you're selecting for resistance, you will make good progress within a few generations. Okay, well, the first thing we can do to improve resilience is to feed the goats. Now, this is a, a very simple exercise. If you go through um, your pen of goats and do a body condition score, you can actually feel their sides, feel their short ribs and their dorsal spinous processes, which are the, the, uh, the bits of skeleton that poke up from their vertebrae, poke up um, uh, you know, vertically you can actually give a score against a body condition score chart for each of those goats. And we know that the goats that are in better condition are better able to cope with the worm burden. Now, it's difficult to find a really good case study, but luckily there has been one provided for us by this, um, uh, this particular trial that was done in Mexico and you notice that it was done on these uh, hair sheep lambs, the pelibuies, which are very similar to goats in that they are um, uh, hair sheep and they have a similar metabolism and uh, behaviour to goats. There's uh, no studies that I could find that directly relate to goats, but there's hundreds of studies in sheep, and this is the closest one that, that uh, gives us a good example. So they actually got these um, lambs and gave them three different feeding levels. Then they infected them with the barber's pole worm. So they had three goats, uh, sorry, three pens of goats. 10 of the goats were given enough feed for them to grow at an average daily gain of 75 grams per head per day. So, you know, good, good, healthy, uh, good, healthy growth rate. They're consuming about 3% of their body weight every day. The other goats were given a higher level of feed, 3.3% of their body weight, and they were growing at 125 grams per head per day. And then the third group of goats were given enough feed, 3.7% of their body weight, that they were growing at the rate of 200 grams per head per day, which if you've ever fed goats and, uh, and weighed them, you know is very, very fast growth rate, so very healthy growth rate. And then at the start of the trial, when the goats are about six months old, uh, sorry, the lambs are about six months old, 24 kilos, they were given 10,000 infective larvae of barber's pole worms, and then that was repeated the next day. So every lamb was given the same dose of barber's pole worms. Okay, let's see what happened. So we can see the three groups there. It says diets one, two, three. They're the three groups. They had the same number of lambs in them. If we look across on day 21, their worm egg counts are very different. So the lambs that had the fastest growth rates, the best nutrition, had the lowest worm egg counts. And that's even more pronounced at day 25 and even higher difference at day 28. So we can see consistently that the lambs that were on the highest growth rates, the best level of nutrition, had the lowest worm egg counts. Now, what does that mean? 
uh, when we're actually looking at infection with worms? Well, it means that they've actually got better um, levels of red blood cells as well because they measured the red blood cells in each of their groups and the lambs that had the highest growth rates and were on the best diet had significantly higher numbers of red blood cells as shown by the hematocrit or their packed cell volume, which is simply the percent of red blood cells in the bloodstream compared to the lambs on the lower diets. Now, these lambs weren't being starved by any means. They still had pretty tidy growth rates, but that simple difference in their growth rates and the level of nutrition that they were getting was enough to decrease their ability to fight off the worms and their ability to maintain high levels of red blood cells. The other critical factor when we're feeding goats is the sward height. If we're continually exposing goats to very low sward height and they're chewing at grass, it's down around ground level, then they're likely to pick up high levels of worms. And that's because the natural distribution of worm larvae on the grass is um, very highly weighted towards the bottom of the sward. And in fact, there's a big reservoir of worms down at ground level in the top centimetre of soil. Now those, um, those worm larvae, when they're given a chance, when there's a bit of moisture, will climb up the stalk and of course be eaten by the goats when they're grazing down low. But if goats are able to graze up high, particularly above um, five centimetres or preferably even higher, then there's very little pickup of worm larvae. Now that means for our goats that are in um, fairly confined small spaces, even if they're fed on the ground, they're likely to be picking up um, high amounts of worm larvae from the ground or from the green pick that's very close to the ground. Okay, well, how do we get around this? Well, our friends in the dairy goat industry have largely uh, looked at this problem and said, well, the safest way to keep dairy goats, which when you think about it, are the, um, the peak of uh, you know, intensive high production goats in Australia, they put them into dry lots or feed lots. They take them away from the grass, they put them into yards that have no grass and they feed them. They feed them on pellets, they feed them on, on straw, hay, silage, whatever it takes to allow them to have maximum nutrition, maximum productivity without picking up lots of worms. Now, of course, this doesn't suit everyone. Many of us um, realise that the great advantage of uh, being in Australia or New Zealand where we have um, the world's best temperate grasslands is that our grass grows really well. And that's our big competitive advantage in world markets that we've got wonderful agronomists who are able to produce um, really excellent uh, grasses for our livestock. And so we have to, have to think if we, we're not considering dry lotting or feed lotting, what else can we do? Well, a lot of it hinges around matching the goat's nutritional needs to their metabolic needs. And a great tool for doing that is to look at the MLA publication going into goats and look at module seven on nutrition. And there's a lot of tools there. A very useful one I find is looking at this one, which is um, uh, tool 7.9, uh, doing a forage budget. And that will help you to work out what are the actual metabolic needs of the goats. And that's based on what their, um, what their live weight is, the number of goats, the number of days they're spending in the paddock. And then you can actually assess the amount of pasture available in tons of dry matter and seeing if that actually matches the goat's needs. And so that's, uh, that's what this simple exercise does, it allows you to match the amount of feed available to the amount of uh, requirements of the goats. Now, of course, 
you have to add extra feed for uh, growth rates, particularly if they're growing quickly. Uh, pregnancy, which can double the amount of uh, metabolic energy required um, by the does. Lactation, which does the same thing, particularly when they have multiple births. And then also match the nutrition for any deficiencies, uh, including the common trace elements, and particularly for protein, which can be a limiting factor for goats on um, very extensive um, pastures. Now, another great tool for balancing nutritional needs is looking at the Australian Feed Base Monitor. And that allows you to, uh, to look at, at your area and find out what the, uh, what the feed conditions are. And then to fine tune that, you can use the MLA Pasture Ruler to go out and do some measurements on your place. And the other thing is you can use a, a metal frame or um, my favourite one is the hula hoop to, uh, to actually go and look at, uh, look at pasture in detail and find out not just the quantity, but also make an estimate of the quality. And that includes the uh, digestibility and the palatability and the protein concentration of that pasture so that you can match that to your goat's needs. Right. The other thing we can do for our goats is to select the next generation for improved resistance. And this is um, something, I've got a picture of the uh, Phil here in the lab with Adriana um, doing some worm egg counts on goats so that they can work out which ones have the highest worm egg counts so the owners can select the next generation. And that's a very useful tool because if you look at um, a mob of goats in the paddock, as I mentioned before, they've got a very high level of variation. Some will have high worm egg counts, others will have low worm egg counts. And if you're selecting the next generation, you're trying to get um, uh, next level worm control, you really want the parents of the next generation to be the low worm egg count bucks and does. So by taking samples, you can do worm egg counts and check out which ones are most likely to have progeny that have a low worm egg count. Now there's a lot of information about this on the Worm Boss tool on the Worm Boss page called Breeding for Worm Resistance. And there's links to Kid Plan. And Kid Plan is all about choosing the best goats for your systems uh, for the different traits that are important for you. And that includes uh, resistance or immunity to worms. So all those tools are available now and a lot of the studs that sell bucks or even does will give you estimated breeding values um, for worm egg count. That will allow you to um, uh, choose the animals that are most suitable for pasture conditions. Now this goes hand in glove with the, the old saying, um, you know, you don't want sooky goats on your place. Now that's something that's attributed to Gareth um, uh, Bath, who is a very influential um, sheep and goat uh, veterinarian. And it helps us to sort of understand the, the mindset. You know, what's a, what's a sooky goat or a sooky sheep look like? It's these ones that do very poorly, the ones that aren't resilient when they're under worm attack. So this one's got a bottle jaw, it's got very pale, um, very pale mucous membranes. And when you look in the eyes, you can actually get an objective score by looking at the farmer chart chart and scoring these animals to see whether they have um, you know, a very healthy um, uh, pink color to their mucous membranes, particularly that lower eyelid or a very pale color. Now this is a fairly, um, a fairly specialized technique and it's taught by some of our goat veterinarians such as uh, Dr. Sandra Baxendall from Goat Vet Oz or um, Dr. Kylie Greentree or Dr. Baron Squires from New South Wales DPI and Vic DPI uh, respectively. And so if you get a chance, that's a really handy uh, technique to pick up because as well as giving you forward warning of um, when the animals are going to be affected by worms, it also helps you to select 
the word the the goats that you don't want to breed from and help you to uh, get them out of your herd and conversely the ones that you do want to be the parents of the next generation Well, that brings us to setting up a low worm risk goat property. What are the things that we can do? Well, the best place to start is a helicopter view. Let's have a look at the, the, whole, the whole system, not just the goats or the worms or the drenches, but take a helicopter view and look at the whole system, being aware that there are um, a lot of interactions with the environment, with the rainfall, with the height of the pasture, with the type of pasture that will impact the amount of worms that these goats are going to be um, exposed to. And the best place to start is to first of all, get your calendar and look at your management events. These are the things that are uh, fixed, such as when the bucks go in for joining, when your lambing is planned for, when you are doing routine management procedures, such as weighing, um, drafting, um, turning off animals for sale, or if you have things like shearing or milking or other management events. You can put them all into the calendar so that you can then plan when to take worm egg counts on a regular basis, when to assess the animals directly by doing farmer char, by doing weights, by doing body condition score, to assess them and keep records so that you can see the trends of what's happening across the year. Now to help with an annual program, um, Wormboss has produced all of these different regional programs for goat producers. Now these are designed to go um, into the most appropriate uh, measures for your particular region. And you can see that they're fine tuned for whether you're in a high rainfall, a cool region, or a warm region, or an arid region. And on top of that, there's one uh, special regional program for smallholders, for people who may not have a lot of paddocks or may not have big, big herds of goats, but um, have got uh, very specific needs as well. And so I'd strongly encourage you to look at the Wormboss regional programs to get an overview of what actually happens um, and what you can plan for in your region. And to help you with that, it's good to have an advisor and of course your veterinarian. Now your advisor um, may come from the list of Parabos certified advisors because they're all the people who've gone through the Parabos program, they've passed the exams, and they are able to help you with um, some of the management treatment decisions that you need to make through the year. And your veterinarian is able to diagnose uh, disease, including worms, and give you uh, things like prescriptions and off-label advice so that you can safely treat your animals and observe the correct withholding periods. And I'll just emphasize again, this is a, a little Venn diagram that I've presented before, but it sort of summarizes um, the, the fact that there's a lot of things that you know about your goats in particular that the vet doesn't know. And there's other things that your vet knows, particularly about pharmacology, uh, pharmacokinetics, residues and off-label regulations that are outside of your experience. And so you do have some middle ground, but you need to share the knowledge in order to get the best outcomes, both for your own goats and for your long-term goals for your individual farm. Okay, now getting back to um, the worm life cycle, we know that the worm life cycle generally takes about 21 days, and we can use that to our advantage by moving goats appropriately according to uh, when the paddocks are likely to become infected. Now, the safest bet is to take advantage of the four-day period between when worm eggs are dropped in the goat's droppings to when they hatch and turn into infective larvae. Now, generally, that's four days. Over the winter, it can be longer. But if you've got 
um, goats that are contaminating paddocks, move them into a fresh paddock within four days and they won't become contaminated or they won't become infected from worm eggs from the droppings that they've dropped themselves. And similarly, if you put goats into a paddock that's already contaminated, they'll start to contaminate that paddock with their own worm eggs after 21 days. And so both of those um, time periods in the worm life cycle are very useful for working out how to best manage uh, the goats depending on their, um, their you know, how, how wormy they are and how wormy the paddocks are. And that means that you can, uh, you can change, um, change paddocks uh, every four days and get them onto a rotation cycle that keeps them one step ahead of the paddocks because it allows those paddocks to be rested and allows the number of infective larvae on those pastures to decrease before the goats go back in there. Now we've done some um, worm egg counts um, and the average of about four and a half thousand goats that have come through the Dorbert's laboratory in recent times is um, they're generally carrying uh, the individual counts are about 519 eggs per gram and the um, food counts, and for some reason the pool counts are higher, is 727 eggs per gram. So that's across, that's the average across all the different goat uh, herds that we've tested. And if you, uh, if you look at a, only, if the average of this mob was only half what the average pool was across Australia, then that's 375 eggs per gram. And they're, they're producing, with a kilogram of dung that each goat produces each day, 375,000 eggs per goat per day. So 100 goats are going to produce uh, 37 and a half million eggs every day onto the pasture. So it's easy to see how those pastures become very highly contaminated. And if those goats were staying on that pasture, they'd be exposed to those worm larvae. However, if they move off, give those pastures a chance to, um, uh, to lose the, the worm larvae, then they'll have a better chance of coping with them or being resilient to the worms. So worm larvae, um, as you've no doubt seen before, um, accumulate in uh, dew drops on the grass. And this one dew drop has you know, dozens of little larvae. They're only about 0.7 of a millimetre long hiding there in the grass. As the larvae heat up, they actually run out of energy because they use up all their energy when they're exposed to higher temperatures. At the lower temperatures, they're conserving their energy and they last a long time. And that helps us to understand the pasture larval degradation rate. And if we look at the different temperatures, we can see after 90 days, now there's still about a third of the larvae left over winter because at 10 degrees, you know, the larvae don't degrade very quickly at all. And yet if that was over summer at temperatures of 35 degrees, then after 90 days, then almost all of those worm larvae have disappeared. So this gives us a good idea as to how long we need to spell pastures in order to get clean pastures. Now there's a lot of things that we can do apart from spelling that also reduce the amount of larvae on the pasture. So the first one is to rotate with cattle or dry stock. Of course, do your worm egg count um, EBVs of your bucks. Uh, Barbavax has been trialled in goats with good results in some trials. So it's used off label in goats um, to good effect in some places. Biowormer is a fungus that's fed in the feed every day and it actually attacks the worm larvae in the goat's dung. And under the right conditions, it can kill 60 to 70 percent of the worm larvae in the dung. Rotating pastures, bearing in mind those two key timings of four days for the cleanest pastures, 21 days if the goats weren't particularly um, 
wormy, but they had um, contaminated pastures that they're recontaminating. Spelling them for long periods, like the nomadic herdsmen of Central Asia, is of course the ideal solution. Only come back to the pastures after a year. Low stocking rates also help. Short joining periods help because you're reducing the amount of time that the does which are immunosuppressed because of their high metabolic demands, both producing the kids and lactating, and they produce a lot more worm eggs and they contaminate pastures very quickly. And then scanning, using an ultrasound pregnancy scanning scanner, drafting your multiples and your singles and your dry, doesn't shouldn't be used, it should be does. Another thing is preparing specific pastures for the goats by sowing clean pastures. And of course, they're going to have um, very, very low worm, worm burdens when the goats first go in. And alternate grazing with cattle or even with horses, because there's very few uh, worms shared between the cattle and the horses. And the way that they graze allows the pasture to be opened up a bit and um, you get better utilisation of pasture as well. Making hay or silage takes away a lot of the worm larvae and exposes the ones down at ground level to uh, both UV radiation and heat and forces them to kill. And then finally, doing monitoring using worm egg counts um, to see what the worm egg count levels of the goats are so that you can then know how badly contaminated the paddocks are. And a good example is um, this farm where the very wormy paddocks have been given a red light, the ones with mild contamination and orange, and the low risk paddocks a green light. So that the ones that have been grazed by very wormy mobs of goats have got a red light and they'll need to be rested for longer or have hay or something else done but the ones that have been spelled for a long time or have had cattle in them or have been um, uh, used for hay or some other purpose are the ones that then get the green light because they'll have very low contamination. And finally, our learning never finishes. It's a lifelong process and we need to constantly upskill ourselves on what's happening both in research and um, from other producers and a really good way to do that is to subscribe to the Paraboss newsletter and also go to the Wormboss website to find out uh, all there is to know about your own goat worm control program. So just to emphasize for your goat worm control program you need to be looking at the whole spectrum of different tools, different management techniques, as well as using your drenches um, if you need to. If you can get away without drenches, then you will have um, healthy goat herds, just like they did back 2000 years ago. But you can actually assess your own uh, practices by using the, um, the wagon wheel, and these are the ones we use at our Worm Boss uh, workshops to allow you to score yourself on your strengths, where you're doing really well, and potential weaknesses or places that you're not uh, maximizing utilization of those tools. And if you want to find out any more about any details that you uh, looked at today, please uh, get in touch with uh, Parabos, look at the website and um, put in any questions you have into the, into the question box now. So thanks, I'll hand back to Fiona now and we might go through some questions. Thanks, Matt. What a great presentation. There was a lot of um, information in that presentation. You did really well to cover it in the short period of time we had. No surprises, we have lots of questions. We always get some really good questions from goat producers. So we'll cook up with the first one from Paula. And it's about sucking lice on her Angora goats. And she's used a few products, Extinistad, Pestine, and injectable ivermectin. 
but none of them have worked and she's been struggling for over a year now. Do you have any suggestions, Matt? Yeah, I do. Um, now, unfortunately, there were some registered products for goats that did work very well, but they're no longer available. And I'm talking about um, particularly Clout S, which is a Delta Methrin product, which worked very well on goat lice. Now, it was a pour on, and so it meant that, um, you know, if you wanted full coverage, you'd pour it on the back and maybe also put a little bit on the pole of the head. So when the goats groom, they would uh, spread that product, you know, to other parts of their body. Now, Clout S is no longer available. I think it's been taken off the market and um, therefore it's difficult to, to recommend something that is registered for goats. So that one, we might take that one, Paula, um, offline if you could contact um, uh, um, Fiona is probably the best best way to do it we'll take that offline and, and work out a more specific um, answer for you thanks Matt the next one's from Kylie about doing worm out counts every six weeks but then not necessarily drenching and less needed so only she must be doing individual worm counts and then only drenching the wormy goats is that a good option Matt yeah this is a great option and look you don't even have to drench you don't even have to worm egg count every goat you know you you pick the ones that are sort of like indicator goats and you do worm egg counts on them, and then you can work out for yourself, you know, if the goats have a need to be drenched by their, their weights, their body condition score, or their the color of their gums, or the presence of any other signs, including in the Angora goats, they might even have scours or, or loose tongue. Um, so yes, yeah, very good option there. You don't need to drench every goat unless you're actually looking at um, cleaning up a paddock in which case it's safer to drench every goat. But if you're set stocked, then um, definitely only treat them according to their needs. Thanks, Matt. Um, question from Frank. Why has the research from Condobolin, which was done by Peter Holst and Cameron Allen, never been produced? At the time, they purchased from the program Bucks for what was then their milk-fed kids before introducing boar goats. Yeah, good point. I, I haven't seen that, Frank, so uh, I'd love to see that. Um, I wonder if that was an MLA project, in which case it might be in the archives. Thanks, Matt. A question from Baron: What is the effectiveness of uh, positing the drench in the correct spot using the syringe, which you had in one of your earlier photos in the talk there, Matt, compared to using one of the commercial drench guns? Uh, look, Nothing really barren. It's uh, for individual animals, a syringe is okay. And you're getting exactly the right dose for each animal. It's very easy to adjust, but usually we're using a drench gun. Thank you. Um, from Leslie, have any bull goat breeders that you know of, Matt, had experience with COWP to fight Barber's pole worm? We started to, to study the effects reduction tests on about 50 of their goats and that was looking promising but due to illness and care we had to give up to divert our time elsewhere so they stopped that study. Yeah good point Leslie copper oxide wire particle is um, available in little capsules you put down the goat's um, throat using a, a, a balling gun an applicator and um, what happens is the capsule breaks open and the little copper oxide wire particles are only about a millimetre long, coat the um, abomasum, the fourth stomach of the goat, and they release copper slowly. Now, the, the impact on barber's pole worm, it, it'll kill maybe 50% of the barber's pole worm if you use it like that, and sometimes more. And I know that Dr. Sandra has um, used it in conjunction with uh, drenches to enhance the effect of the drench. But again, that's off label and the specific details would probably need to be worked out with your vet. Thanks, Matt. Um, Jacinta said, excellent presentation. Thanks, Matt. Firstly, will there be a copy of the recording made available? All our webinars can be found on the Parabos website there, Jacinta. 
And also are the slides available separately? Not normally, just in to you may be able to contact Matt directly if you're after specific information. That would be my suggestion. And to finish off her question, where can we find additional information and resources on measuring pasture there, Matt, like your pasture ruler that you showed? Yeah, that's a that's an MLA resource. I find that really handy. You keep one in the glove box, or you know, just um, somewhere somewhere that's convenient, and uh, you can whip it out and do a very quick measurement on the pasture. So MLA resource. Um, as a goat producer, you are um, paying MLA levies, and um, MLA are very good at uh, making you know, handy little tools like that. So you can write to them. Um, using the contact um, on the uh, MLA uh, webpage and just request any of those um, either uh, resources such as the um, going into goats booklets or those um, those rulers. Hula hoop, I think you'll have to maybe go down to your favourite toy store and, and find one there. <laughs> uh, another question from Frank here, and it must have been towards the end of the presentation, Max, the question came in at two o'clock and it was about the flock that you showed. So it must've been a picture. Um, what are the goats used for specifically? And if that's not giving you enough hint to the question, Frank, I might need you to just give me a little bit more information in the Q and A. It might've might been the rangeland goats, Frank, which are, well, <laughs> you could say they're multi-purpose goats because I think they've got a bit of cashmere in them if you're if you're patient enough to uh, to comb that out, like the Mongolian um, cashmere goat herders do. But rangeland goats they're typically just um, used for as meat goats, and they're they're very uh, very hardy, very well adapted to the environment. Uh, next question is from Tammy. Are there any natural remedies, Matt, that you know of that will help in with worm control in goats? Uh, look, there's been a huge amount of um, research put into natural remedies. The, the best example are particular um, pastures which you can um, which you can sow that have got um, you know tannins in them that tend to reduce um, worm burdens. Now, unfortunately, they don't work as well as the drenches, but of course, you know, any help is a benefit in some cases. And there is information on Worm Boss about these um, pastures that have been that have been developed. So yes, there are, but we don't get too excited about them because sometimes the presence of tannins means that they're not as palatable to the goats and so the goats don't like to eat them so you get you know one benefit and one one loss from the same intervention thanks Matt. looking at the drenches that are currently on the market i suppose for sheep like star tech have there been any studies on their effectiveness in goats do you know no um that dequantal star tech um, I haven't seen anything published on the efficacy of um, star in goats, and I know that it is toxic to horses, um, so I'd be quite cautious um, using it. Thanks, Matt. Um, Deborah is after more information on rotation with cattle. How many days between the goats and the cattle, and cattle before or goat or cattle after, and does co-grazing, so grazing both of them at the same time, work just as well? Look, I'll just reverse the order. Co-grazing isn't as effective as um, uh, rotation and for the simple fact that when you're grazing with cattle, you're effectively spelling that pasture for goat worms. And so the goat worms are dying off while all the time that the, the cattle are in there. Whereas if you're co-grazing, the, you know, the goat worms are accumulating the whole time the cattle are in there. So that's why rotating is always better than co-grazing. As far as the um, information on rotation with cattle, this is quite complex, but there has been some wonderful research done by Dr. Justin Bailey at the University of New England. And that's been published. And a lot of that has been um, 
worked into Wormboss fact sheets. And so I'd refer you back to Wormboss for information on rotational grazing. Matt, a question from Kieran. Have there been any studies done on burning pastures in order to reduce the larval numbers? Will burning kill the larvae that are in the soil? Um, short answer, yes, it will. And uh, I'm not suggesting that you do it, though, because burning will have an impact on you know, beneficial organisms in the soil and the ability of the, the grass to regenerate. But yes, it definitely is effective in reducing larval numbers. Uh, from Tammy, is there anything you can do to make your soil more worm resistant? Um, to make the soil more worm resistant. Now look, this has also been the subject of a lot of research and um, the short answer is yes, there are things, including things like even things as simple as nitrogen fertiliser and particularly liquid fertiliser that have been found to have an impact on worms. But it's all been left at the research stage because no one's actually found something that's economical or, or worthwhile um, doing on a large scale. On a small scale, it might be useful doing something like that. And if you do have a small farm that's being grazed continually, then something like biowormer, which doesn't actually go into the soil, it needs to be fed in the feed every day and goes into the dung, is a useful way of decreasing um, the worm larvae. Um, thanks, Matt. Another question from Karen is the 3% residual levels detected in the goat meat industry. Do you know if that's high compared to what it is in the lamb and beef industry, Matt? Yeah, very high, very high. And you can check those yourself, Kieran. They're on that um, Australian Government National Residue Survey website if you do want to check them out. Thank you. Um, Frank's just, um, yes, it was your neighbour's flock that he was talking about with that picture there on the meat oh, goats that were raised thanks. on Razor back 20 years ago. So thank you for confirming that. Good. If the last question here, if goats are feeding off the ground with no grass, is there a way they can still pick up worm larvae? Goats are feeding off the ground with no grass. Yeah, look, Lisa, the bottom line there is, you know, what was in that um, what was in that pen or that paddock prior to the, you know, the no grass. There could still be larvae in the ground, but generally the the larvae in the ground very quickly die out. So if you've got um, what we we call in the in the sheep game at least a dry lot, or in the cattle game a feed lot, um, then um, you'll have very, very low levels of worms on the grass or on the ground um, for, the, for the goats to pick up. Great. Thanks very mu much, Matt. That brings us to the end of today's Parabos presentation. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's been a really great presentation with really good interactive questions, which I always appreciate. Um, so it's, I'll sign off now and let you go. And our next webinar will be on the 13th of June. More information is coming out on our social media platforms about that shortly. And we're going to be talking all about lice next month. So looking forward to seeing some of you then. That's all for us here today. Bye for now. Thanks, Fiona. See ya.